Hey, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, this is this talk is about Powder, which is a uh, new project we started earlier this year, and right. Um, yeah, it's about zkVMs. What are what are zkVMs? Uh, it's short for zero knowledge virtual machine, and the, we have a slight problem because when people say zero knowledge, they usually don't mean zero knowledge. Instead, they just mean verifiable computation. So. Usually, the focus is not on the zero knowledge part, but on the verifiable computation part. And this is also where we have our focus. And uh, what does it mean? Um, it means that someone claims that a certain program on a certain input returns a certain output. And we want to verify that claim. And of course, the most easiest way to verify, or the most straightforward way to verify this claim is to just re-execute the program. But yeah, the, the cool thing is that, that we now have technologies where we can encode this claim into a statement uh, where there's a way to verify the statement faster than just re-executing the program again. And um, you can distinguish two ways to do it here. Uh, the one is via circuits, and the other one is via virtual machines. And the, the, the difference here is that a circuit has a, has a fixed size and a fixed length and can essentially just verify a, a fixed size statement, run a fixed size program. But for virtual machines, um, we, we can run dynamic programs. So we have, um, yeah, we have a, a program counter, and we can have jumps and all the usual things we know from, from virtual machines. And yeah, the, the, big, the big advantage of virtual machines is that you can uh, create a proof for an arbitrary long program execution and not just a fixed circuit. Um, so, and many different zero knowledge virtual machines have been built in the past months. Um, and uh, we, wanna, we don't want to build another zero-knowledge zero virtual machine. Instead, we want to provide a toolkit that allows you to uh, make it easier to build these things. Because um, so the, the problem we, we saw with existing ZKVMs is that they are all very specific to a certain VM. So you, you start out and fix an architecture, and then you build your virtual machine for it. And most people also just build everything from scratch, so have a very custom, direct implementation uh, of this virtual machine. And um, of course, there's an advantage to building everything from scratch and having custom, fine-tuned implementations for everything. And this is performance, probably. Uh, we'll get to that later. And, uh, but there are also some disadvantages. And uh, first and foremost, I would say it's very hard to audit a ZKVM that has been built from scratch in a new, in a new way to do it and in a new language. Um, and if you, if you change your mind later on and think, oh, yeah, maybe I want to reduce the number of registers or I want to increase the bit width of the registers, then this is a change that is very hard to do because you have to go through all your uh, implementation to the very bottom to uh, affect this change. And yeah, of course, it's also lots of, lots of effort to, to just build and maintain it. And um, often people target it towards a, a single specific prover or at least proof system. And so if a new proof system uh, comes along, then it's very difficult to impossible to change to that new proof system. And yeah, the, the, the individual components you build are often also very hard to re reuse. So um, I would like to make the analogy to, I don't know, computer games in the 80s. When you build a computer game, or when you, yeah, in the 80s, then you build it for a specific machine. And you probably write it directly in assembly, or at least large parts are written in assembly. And then when you want to port it to a different computer, then usually you have to rewrite it from scratch, or at least rewrite a lot of things from scratch, the, the stuff you, read, you wrote in assembly. Uh, but nowadays, software development is very different. Uh, we have things like LLVM or yeah, also GCC, uh, where 
you can combine multiple front-end languages with multiple uh, architectures. So you, you just write it in Rust once, and you can compile it to, to different uh, machine tabs, different architectures, and the compiler will just handle it for you. Um, yeah, so, and this is where we see Powder. So Powder, the, the idea is that Powder is the LLVM of, of zero-knowledge virtual machines. OK, let's get more into detail about what Powder actually is. Um, so it's, it's a compiler stack that allows you to define zero-knowledge virtual machines. And yeah, in a modular way, so you can also have core processors and dedicated chips. And it abstracts away the, the low-level constraints you would write other, otherwise. So you can do it in a quite high-level way. And uh, you don't have to care about prover complexity and all these things. And you can build your machines in a very modular way. We plan to have a standard library that has modules for hashes, uh, elliptic curve operations, whatever that you can just use, and that works with the code you have written. And since, so this is all the, the powder code you write is not, uh, for example, Rust. It's, it's its own language, which has the benefit that the whole system uh, can analyze, you, you can, it is all formalized in a single system, so you can analyze the code, you can check for non-determinism, you can do formal verification to, to uh, yeah, verify correctness of execution, and you can run various kinds of optimizations on it. And the, the idea, the hope, the goal is that it's very easy to build, test, and audit zero-knowledge uh, zero virtual machines. I should train that word a bit better. <laughs> OK, so here's a, um, an overview of the architecture of Powder. And on the left side, you see different front ends we support. It is, in a sense, front-end agnostic, so everyone can just write a new front-end for it. And uh, on the right-hand side, we have prover backends we support. So the the, the scope of Powder is, uh, it ends at the, at the prover backend, so we do not want to write our own provers. And um, Powder essentially has two stages. The first is the assembly stage, and the second is the, the pill stage uh, that works with low-level polynomial constraints. And um, so the idea is also that you can so these two stages are not strictly um, separated. They can interact with each other. And you can also choose at which stage you want to start. So if you want to have a more low-level approach, you can start with, with pill code directly and feed that into, into Powder and uh, uh, generate your prover and verifier. Or you can start from, from assembly. You can also, I don't know, start from Rust and say, oh, I just, wanna, I just want to have the Powder assembly code and then I'll do something else with it, or I just want to have the low-level pill code, and then I'll do something else with it. So the idea is it's, it's very modular. And um, Powder will do... So you can... The, the only thing you need for Powder is your Powder source code, and you do not, not need to write additional things like um, a witness generator, a constant generator. So the, all the intermediate values that arise in the execution of a, or in the, in the proof generation, that will be automatically generated by Powder. OK, and um, to, yeah, more like to, to validate the concept, we wrote an example front end that implements risk 5 and uh, it took us roughly 300 lines to implement the risk 5 architecture so 300 lines of powder code we will see later how that looks and um, yeah so and with this we are able to generate proofs for all the backends i listed from any no std rust code uh, out of the box using powder is used. The single, co single command, you run the powder command and interface, provide a crate or a, a Rust file, and it executes it and generates a proof. And uh, we also have uh, different virtual machines and architectures in preparation. Um, 
EVM and Valida, and this is nice because uh, it allows us to compare how different architectures work. So, you, of course, you can, you can take an EVM interpreter written in Rust and compile that through the RISC-V toolchain, uh, but you can also see how this compares to an EVM interpreter or EVM virtual machine written directly in, in Powder Assembly, or you can compare how um, compiling Rust through the Valida virtual machine works as opposed to uh, our RISC-V virtual machine. Okay, so I think we have a lot of time for questions. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's take a look at some example code. So uh, here on the left, we have Rust code. And um, this, yeah, I'll, I'll just assume you know some Rust, otherwise it's too complicated. So this is no SCD code, that's the only requirement. And we actually import an external crate, a tiny Kachuk that's, that's computing the Kachuk. It's just an, a crate that exists out there. We didn't, we didn't change anything there. Um, and uh, this program computes a hash, and at the end it asserts that the hash equals some value. And the idea is if, so the, the, the proof is valid if the program does not panic. If it panics, so if the assertion fails, then you can't generate a valid proof. And um, we take that program, uh, use regular, the regular Rust compiler, and turn that into RISC-V 32-bit assembly. You can see the beginning of the main function in the middle. And then uh, we do a, yeah, a local transformation, or yeah, a simple transformation, to turn this LLVM assembly code into powder assembly code. So you can maybe see some similarities between the middle and the right. So, uh, in the, in the first line, we have the, we add SP, or we compute SP minus 480 and add that to SP again. And in powder, we only use unsigned numbers, so this, this is a large number, not a negative. And then we do some memory stores. Um, so this is, this is roughly how powder assembly looks, but it's actually much, much cooler because this is just the, just the assembly part and the, the main point of Powder is that it allows you to define a full virtual machine architecture in user code. So um, when, you, when you start out with an empty Powder file, you have nothing. You don't have instructions. You don't have registers. Um, you can and also have to define them all on your own. And uh, we can see how that works here on the left. Um, we define a register called PC, which, is a, we, we, which we tell Powder that it's a special register. And then we have uh, four more registers, X, Y, and Z, which are assignment registers, and then a general purpose register A. And then we define a jump instruction. And the jump instruction takes a label. And what it does is it sets the PC to that label. So this prime uh, on the PC, this tick, uh, means that it's the next value of the PC register. And uh, Inside these curly braces, these are constraints written in the low-level PIL language. And for an instruction, the constraint is only active when the construction is, or the, con the, the constraint is only enabled when the instruction is active. And the same for the, the assertion. We require that X and Y are equal, but only when the instruction is active. And then we have an add instruction, and this is delegated to a, to a different specialized arithmetic submachine. And uh, inside this function, then, we have the, the actual program, so the instruction. This is what you, what you saw on the earlier slide. And what it does is it has a start label, it adds 2 and 1, stores it into A, and then it asserts that A is equal to 3, and it jumps again to the start. So a very simple, very simple example. And um, yeah, as you saw already, we have these low-level constraints inside the instructions, and the idea is that you can always interface from the higher abstraction layer, also with the lower abstraction layer. So this is, I don't have an example for that, but we have a way where you can define a, or where you can declare a Rust function, and then link that up to a lower level machine that actually has, is just a specialized circuit just for this single function, and it's, it will be translated into a single instruction later on. Um, 
And then, yeah, the low level is pill. Um, we, so this is heavily inspired by the pill of the same name by Polygon Hermes, but we extended it a little, but it's still mostly compatible. And uh, so this is an example for a machine that computes Fibonacci numbers. And the idea, so how do you think about these constraints or how do you think about these machines is as a, a table. You can see it on the right here. So you have, you have columns. These columns, so register, a, a register in the virtual machine would also correspond to a column. And uh, the, the PC is a column and so on. And um, here in the low-level pill, you can directly define these columns. And um, we have two types of columns. We have fixed and, and witness columns. And the, fixed, the difference is that the fixed columns are directly defined, and the witness columns are just inferred from the constraints. And uh, so we have simple code here for the first column to set it to 1 on the first row and 0 on all the others. And then we have two witness columns, x and y. And then we have these two constraints here. Uh, first times y minus 1 equals 0, and first times x minus 1 equals 0. And the idea is that these constraints have to be satisfied on every single row. right? So, um, and if you look at the first row, there we have first equals 1. So the only, may, only way to make this expression 0 is that y minus 1 equals 0 and x minus 1 equals 0. So x and y both have to be 1. So this is a way to initialize these uh, constraints on the first row. And on the other rows, first is already 0. So this will be 0 regardless of the value of x and y. And then we have the a little bit more complicated uh, constraints further down. Uh, let's ignore this 1 minus first prime um, for now. And so if you, if you look at x prime minus y equals 0, this prime again says we are talking about x, but on the next row. And we are talking about y on the current row. And this, in, in the end, this means if you have x prime minus y equals 0, it essentially means you copy y from one row to x in the next row. And you can see, if you look at the table, this is, this is what happens here. And the, the, the last constraint here is what actually does the the Fibonacci uh, thing. And this essentially says that y on the next row equals x plus y on the current row. So this, this defines the Fibonacci series. OK, so this is the, the low-level pill. Um, and uh, that's also the end of my talk. Uh, please, so we have... so. I didn't say that, but I assume that this is the case for everyone here, because we are an open community. This is all open source, of course. And um, uh, we have a website where you can check out some examples. And uh, yeah, if you have questions that don't fit this format here, then please get in touch. Otherwise, ask me now. Yeah, thanks for your attention. Um, thanks for the talk and also a really amazing project um, because uh, it's still very complicated to build anything. Um, I, I had maybe one or two questions, however much time we have. Um, can I write both explicit circuits optimized for a specific function or VMs? I was a bit confused because you said architecture for ZK VMs, but also sometimes I just want to write explicit circuits. Uh, the, the audio is really bad here. I, I'm <laughs> uh, um, what was the second word? So, uh, Can I? <laughs> I, I? No, it's my fault. I just need to speak in the mic. Um, I'll, I'll repeat. So you said it's a compiler for ZK VMs, but can I also use it to write explicit circuits, not VMs? I, I mean, or... You can write. So our lowest level is this polynomial constraint language. Uh, and this, you can write circuits in this constraint language, but they don't really look like circuits, right? So this is, this is targeted towards the, this, this plug-up uh, thing, mm -hmm. right? And, but it is, yeah, kind of compatible, right? But it, it's, not, it's not like you, you can't write circuits as you can write in CIRCOM, for example. Right. Yeah. And then um, 
if I am allowed, I'll, I'll pass the mic back. Um, you had this uh, tick to indicate the next value of the register, and then in the pill table, it was sort of the next row, I would understand. Can you, <clears throat> can you make like more advanced patterns in the table as well? in the language, or is that still? So we, the syntax does not support it yet, but it's, this is planned to, to allow it. So you right. to go say, oh, the yeah, exactly. reach four uh, rows down and stuff, and four rows back, or whatever. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, I have two questions. The first one is, uh, I already asked you like three times, but I need to, <laughs> I need to remember. Why not risk uh, 64, like risk 564? No, we have 32-bit. Yeah, exactly. Why did uh, because it, it fits better with the Goldilocks field. So you can do right. um, multiplication directly. Thanks. And the second question was, uh, at some point, like when you showed the, the disassembly, um, like the, the RISC-5 disassembly compared to the, to the generated uh, thing. No, sorry, that was the next one. That was the, when the arithmetic machine. You have the operation add, and you have this kind of template specialization syntax with zero in it. Uh, what does so that that's mean? The, yeah, this is a very simple example. Usually you would have um, an arithmetic machine that does not just do addition, but also multiplication, subtraction, and whatever. And uh, this is a syntax that we still have to think about how to improve it, uh, where you say, Add is the first instruction, and then you would have operation mal1 for the second instruction, and so on. So this is just to, yeah. I saw, uh, like, Nova backend. And as far as I know, um, like, when you uh, create, uh, like, if you put computation into Nova, uh, you have to, like, you, you would want to uh, recurse, like uh, do this IVC thing. Uh, and the question is, like, how would you partition the computation into like this paradigm? Because like, as far as I know, this like recursion should be quite big, like each chunk, right? Like 10K constraints or something. And if you put every single like instruction there, it would be, uh, it would have too much overhead. Yes, yeah, so I'm not sure if, if this is only Nova or Supernova or Hypernova or whatever Nova we are now, but as far as I understood, Nova is specialized for opcodes, and for that we actually have a different compilation path where we, uh, where we directly go from the instructions to the backend because we kind of retain the, the concept of an instruction because that is the better supported there. But uh, we also want to have uh, general support general folding schemes. There, of course, the question is, if you have memory, how do you condense that into how you, how you can reach across the, the chunks? But uh, this is uh, in preparation. Cool. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, so. If I understand correctly, you compile Rust or um, something into LLVM, for example, and that gets compiled to Powder ASM. Do you then write custom circuits for like each instruction of Powder ASM to get it to Halo 2? So I, I imagine you have to have like Plunkish constraints, and then you have R1CS or the relaxed one for Nova. So do you have custom handmade circuits for each of these? Uh, no, it's all so it's all compiled compiled down to the this pill language, and that is then modified to support the different backends. So the pill has direct uh, compilation, you could say, to R1CS, for example, or Halo 2 constraints. To Halo 2 constraints. I mean, Halo 2, Halo 2 is also a polynomial constraint uh, system, right? So that that works. Okay. Thanks. Uh, one more question. Any? Um, there's a big note on the Git repo that says "Do not use for production." Do you have any thoughts on when this will be prod ready? Sorry, can you say it again? A uh, timeline for production use. When <laughs> this will be production safe. Uh, no promises. <laughs> Uh, 
But if you have, uh, if you want to integrate it uh, into your system, then please get in touch. So that will help. Uh, do you have any benchmarks you could share in terms of the overhead, for instance, with respect to risk zero or with respect to a ZK VM from someone else? So we're um, the the risk five front end we wrote. It was just a proof of concept to see whether it works. We did not put a lot of effort into uh, optimizing uh, the constraints and things like that. So I don't think at the, that the benchmarks would be very good at the current time. That's all we have time for. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot.